Thanks again, Stephen, and thanks everyone for uh, your warm introduction and welcome to me uh, tonight. And uh, I congratulate you and the organizers for today's event. And I've heard great things uh, through my time before dinner and um, during dinner about how just how great it was. And I think it's this kind of thing that you'll see through the theme of my remarks here for the next uh, 20 or 30 minutes to try to give you a sense for uh, what we see both across Canada uh, as today's picture, and then uh, a little bit of a jump into what we see at IBM, uh, both corporately and in Canada, and then some thoughts about how we can make a difference going to the future. So um, I think there's a, a number of themes here that uh, Steve was touching on that I will try to address as we're going through. We have had a long history in, in Canada, and I've had a long history outside of Canada in my uh, career at IBM. And I was very fortunate to be able to spend a lot of time globally. And I would say that <clears throat> that has sort of helped to shape the, the things that we, that I personally put as a priority when I'm working in my job in Canada. It also puts me into those busy positions and uh, the attempt to try to do something with the Chamber of Commerce as well. So you'll hear some of those things here. And I think um, as we go through this, you'll, you'll hear some themes from IBM that will speak to our uh, desire to partner with you in Nova Scotia, and, uh, and you were very right about all the ingredients here that are, we think are very positive for the future, both of Nova Scotia and for Canada. So first, the bad news. Um, if uh, anybody has not seen how Canada has been forming, performing an innovation, I'm sure this has been said in an innovation forum today. Um, not great. And so uh, the, the conference board uh, ranks us as a D. This is a two-year-old report. The report came out two weeks ago, and I'm on the business innovation panel for them. And uh, they have tons and tons of data that supports that it's not really great. In fact, we're not improving at all. And if anything, against our competitors, we're moving backwards. And uh, no one's really come up with the exact answer why, but um, you know, it is troubling, and it's something that we've got to all try to address. And, that's why it becomes a bit of a team game to say, look, this is not one individual in the country that's going to make this happen, but we do need to sort of step up across different aspects of the economy. And as Stephen said, I am the chair this year of the Chamber of Commerce, and uh, actually uh, Peggy Cunningham, who's uh, the Dean of uh, Business at Dalhousie, is on the board, uh, newly on the board of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce, very proudly. And uh, Karen Oldfield, who's the Port Authority uh, head here in Halifax, is on the board as well. So you have great representation from Halifax on the board. Uh, we've been doing something that actually looks at global competitiveness. So this is 190,000 businesses across the country and 400 chambers of commerce and boards of trade. And you know, it's, uh, it is a small business community that runs, uh, it, that is Canada, honestly. But on the other hand, every small business and every large business has to understand they're in a global competition. And so for the last two years, we've gotten together at the chamber and said, what are the things that we're hearing from our constituents about the top 10 barriers to competitiveness for Canada? It allows us to put a little more focus in front of um, our federal officials and others around the country. And so this was just launched again in, in February of this year. And so you'll see here, I'm just putting them up for the point of, um, well, it's my chamber duty to do so, I think, partially. But uh, here, skills is number one. Uh, workforce productivity and, and our investment in the workforce. Innovation number three. Uh, public infrastructure planning, access to world markets for Canadian energy, tax complexity, trade strategies, trade across provinces, tourism and travel, access to capital, and we were just talking about uh, VC just a second ago. I'm going to come back just to, for one uh, second to the, the top one on skills. We're going to talk about innovation for the rest, but I think it's worth us just saying on skills that it isn't pointing at uh, higher ed. One portion of this is to say, OK, well, are we matching our education system with what the needs are for businesses? And there's a lot of debate around that. And I've heard many things. And I personally believe that it is not the business of even colleges or universities to be giving us employees. This is, uh, they're there for solid, deep learning. And then it's up to us to train people when they come. Uh, but that's a little bit of pat. I'm just. Number one on the list here is to say that uh, there is a concern about what kind of skilled people we have coming into the workforce. Number two is actually reskilling the present workforce. 
and retraining. And that's the number two priority that we're hearing from all kinds of businesses because we have to transform ourselves. Third is immigration and how to be more effective about immigration, how to get the right skills out of uh, the immigrant population. And then fourth is tapping into underutilized uh, work pools. And that would include the Aboriginal uh, work pool as well as persons with disabilities. Um, and I think that actually, just so that um, you understand that this top 10 thing seems to have been working, uh, Minister Flaherty, when he gave his budget just two weeks ago, three weeks ago now, did mention the top 10 list from the Chamber of Commerce and said, that's why I'm putting the job grant program in place so we can reskill workers. And so these things do make a difference. So, you know, get your voice heard and, and talk to Peggy, talk to Karen, make sure that you're getting uh, your voice heard at the national level and we'll make sure that uh, something happens. Now, I'm going to change hats now and start talking about innovation. And I thought I'd introduce you to uh, the, the head of innovation for the IBM Corporation, who will give you a bit of a background here for uh, two minutes on what we think when we think about innovation and how we think about it in Canada. In the highly competitive world we live in today, it is absolutely vital that industry, academia, and the government itself be at the leading edge of R&D. This is a whole new era of computing smart systems. We're starting to see it today because IBM recently had this breakthrough on Watson, which is a system that was incredibly innovative, and it sort of conquered the artificial intelligence barriers that we've been facing. Imagine having systems now that can go another step and self-tune so that you can accelerate yourself by a factor of 10 or 100 and start to tackle incredibly complex problems of big data today that are insurmountable. Modeling the brain, modeling the global climate in one shot, these sort of massive undertakings that were inconceivable 10 years ago are quite conceivable in this new era, but it requires a tremendous amount of investment in research and development. This area of expertise is actually incredibly strong in Canada. There is a lot of very innovative things we can do around emerging topics such as big data. If you think about what's gone on, for instance, the hospital for sick children, we did a project called a Data Baby. What it amounts to is in a premature infant with a very, very uh, poorly developed or underdeveloped immune system. The problem is the first sign of their being ill is their body is being overwhelmed by an infection. By acquiring massive amounts of data over the course of the time that we study children, thousands of data points a second, when we crawl through that deep amount of data, we can actually see the early warning signs of sepsis. And by doing so, we can treat that child before it's obvious to a practitioner that does a problem. The challenges our future generations face are tremendous. There are challenges of energy availability, there are challenges of food availability, there are challenges of transportation. Look at some of the cities that are locked in gridlock today and remember, the number of vehicles may double or quadruple in the next 10 years. The complexities of dealing with society have gone beyond what a human can do themselves. Basically, society is now a deeply engaged system of systems. What we're talking about doing here is improving not just the quality of life, but the efficiency with which we provide it which frees up resources to do other things in society. It's an incredibly virtuous cycle, and to remain competitive in modern society, you have to invest. If you don't make these investments, you will not, in the long term, survive in the global marketplace of today. So a few points uh, from Dr. Meyerson. Um, first, his point is that you have to do this in partnership. You have to invest or you're not going to win in the global marketplace. And by the way, Canada is a great place to do this stuff. So uh, we'll take some credit for convincing him of that. And, and that's been part of what we've been able to accomplish, uh, being able to have our top guy think that Canada is the great place to do this work. Uh, you've just seen here the, the, some of the headlines come up about big data. So I'll spend a couple of minutes on big data. You'll hear about big data everywhere. It's one of the buzzwords. Um, that's been used all along, but uh, I'm going to focus on a couple of characteristics of big data and what we're doing to drive innovation, because at, at the heart of what we're doing is that we're going to try to tackle this problem and, and make it, some solutions happen through this. So big data, what's, what's, why is it coming at us? Well, uh, you can look at the advances of the cognitive systems like Watson, or you can look at the number of devices that are out there. You can look at cloud computing, social media, how many tweets per minute we're all seeing and doing, and the Internet of Things. Everything is connected to everything else. And so if you look at big data, and we break it down into its components, I'm going to give you just a few of the characteristics. And, and so the three obvious ones are here, volume, variety, and velocity. 
And so just a quick, this is almost like a class, isn't it? You know, I feel that way, but I'm not a good teacher. So volume. This is the obvious one that you would say, okay, big data, it's all about how much there is, so much. And if you look in the middle of this graph, somewhere in the middle it says we are here. So 2010 on the left, 2015 on the right. So uh, the traffic here is increasing exponentially, and so you'll have to learn, like we've learned about you know, gigabytes and petabytes and exabytes. Uh, yottabytes is 10 to the 24th, so you'll know about those pretty soon because as you're looking over to the right-hand side, the ingredients here that are driving, it's not just enterprise data that we're using, and it's not over just voice over IP and things over media, but social media, sensors and devices, unstructured data, it's coming at us in waves. And it's a question, really, of how you're going to address those waves. That's really the secret sauce, if you will, about how uh, we drive success. 80% of the data coming to you, to you in variety, then the second V, is unstructured. So it would all be great in the old days of us having relational databases. We were quite proud of that invention, and so rows and columns and DB2, and we made all this stuff happen uh, in a very structured way, and we forced everybody into a structure. These days are gone. It's unstructured, and you've got to find a way to corral that data still and find structure in an unstructured world. In velocity, uh, we're all used to working at a very high pace, but imagine with that volume of data coming at us and the speed that that data is coming at us, the amount of storage you would need to be able to capture it all, to put it into a time space, to set it aside, and then start to mine it, again, for many applications, those days are gone. You have to see it in a point in time, and if you miss that point in time and can't make a decision about it or make a solution happen about it, it's gone. Right? So there are many, many more applications that are happening now in real time. And you'll hear a lot about that and understand a lot about that. But this point of velocity, I can't understate it or, or state it more vociferously in another beat. So usually people stop at volume, variety, and velocity. Uh, we at IBM are adding two more Vs. I, I, we could have come up with another um, consonant, I suppose. But the veracity and vulnerability are, are two other areas that are becoming more and more important. Veracity. So just because it's said so on Facebook or Twitter or Wikipedia or pick your poison doesn't mean it's always true, right? And how do you know that things are true when they're in this high volume? And how can you verify? And I'll take it to the other way around. And actually, there are many more techniques about understanding what you are doing when you're tweeting. And uh, we've had recent examples where, in the last uh, U.S. election, you could actually know a lot about the people who were tweeting on the good or bad side of the president or Romney. And uh, many things could be learned about them, and you knew what kind of cars they were driving, and you knew all kinds of things about them, even though you didn't know who they were. But you knew where they lived, and you knew what side of the vote they were on, and the Obama camp had this tool. And that's all I'm going to say. The Romney camp did not have that tool. So veracity. Uh, vulnerability is the, the final V here, and we all know a lot about this. So security and Q1 Labs out of uh, Fredericton, and we're very proud to have them as part of the IBM company, uh, are one of the mainstays and one of the brilliant uh, groups that have joined us to help us with uh, protecting data and making sure that it stays private when it's private. And so that brings us then to the five Vs of big data, the five big Vs. And uh, that gives you a sense for what we're thinking about. So those are the backdrop points of when we talk about big data, it's not just, oh, there's a lot of it, and how many zeros are on that data. It's more about, okay, let's think about those characteristics and then what we're going to do about it. So let me give you a few thoughts. Again, a couple of stats that says that by this year, more uh, mobile devices than, than uh, people. And that, that tells you a lot. I have a few of them myself, I guess. Um, that we are, this stat about how much we're producing in data comes up all the time. 90% of the world's data was created in the last two years. Uh, I think the Google co-founder said, uh, in two days, we create more data than was created from the beginning of time to 2003. That's his quote. It doesn't really matter. There's a lot of data out there. Um, so now, analytics. Let's talk about that. So. If analytics was so valuable, why doesn't everybody do it? 
and why doesn't everybody have it? And uh, this is actually uh, MIT Sloan, so the MIT people are contributing here as well. And uh, they actually did a study to say, well, why aren't people doing more analytics? And in the top three blues there, in fact, the, the five blues out of the top seven characteristics are organizationally based. They're not about technology. They're about saying, well, I don't understand how to use it, or I don't really have the time for it. You know, I, I've got to, I'm busy making decisions. I can't stop and actually make sure that they're good decisions in that sense. Uh, and we don't have the skills, right? We don't have the skills. And so this is the kind of thing that uh, I'm very pleased that uh, this region really understands. And to the point that uh, Stephen was talking about, the skills need in the marketplace, well, uh, we actually have McKinsey now telling us that um, in the U.S. right now, there's a shortage of 140,000 to 190,000 people with analytics expertise today. And the U.S. Department of Labor, in the U.S. alone, in Canada we're going to use more of them, but it's 20% analytics-based growth in demand between now and 2018. So talk about the jobs that are right in front of us, that are here now. And then 40% of organizations today, so they're not probably even counted in all the stats necessarily, uh, report a skill shortage in the ability to manage information. So this point of, this is starting to become understood, and it's starting to become the secret sauce of how we could do something and if we could just crack this uh, opportunity. So with this explosion of data, you know, if the, the real point of this is to say, well, if you could harness big data, you could develop, so what if you could understand all your customer interactions and then provide value to their next interaction? And there are a lot of organizations starting to do that in retail, CRM, but think of that. If you were able to do that, how much more value would you be able to create in any walk of life, in any industry for your customers compared to others? What if you can anticipate and shape the impact of financial decisions? Well, okay, there you can make your millions if you're in the financial industry. Um, but this is also about investing, but it's also pure banking and understanding the, the movement of funds and so on. What if you could prevent losses from happening, things like fraud, so the insurance industry and so on. So these are the what ifs that are uh, out there and there's lots of ways to kind of crack that. And for, again, for Nova Scotia, some smart people here said, what if your students could understand this explosion? And uh, gain analytics to be able to use in any environment. So in my sense, this is the way of saying, could we teach this in such a way so that we have, you know, we're providing the fishing pole as opposed to the fish. There's not a single answer. You need to have the technique and the ability to take this forward and apply it to all the future situations you're going to find. I'm going to show you, I'm going to get practical now. We're going to start to talk about examples. I'm going to show you an international example, and I think it's appropriate here looking over the harbor uh, that I did pick uh, an example that we have. It's not from Canada, it's from Ireland, and it's our uh, Galway-based Smart Bay project. And I, I just uh, show it to you and then think about big data again in, in, a, in a coastal environment. <laughs> transistors for every human on the planet, each of these costing less than one ten millionth of a cent. Our world is becoming more interconnected. Today there are more than one trillion network things. This causes a messy data problem. So the good news is things are becoming smarter. Algorithms and powerful systems can help us make sense of this data and turn it into intelligence that we can use to make our planet smarter. project coordinator and we're here in the technical support bin of Marine Institute in Gold City and behind me you can see a number of buoys and key pieces of infrastructure that we have deployed and plan to deploy in Galway Bay and these are the backbone of the Smart Bay Initiative which is a research and de development platform for Galway Bay collecting data about the sea and the coastal zone in terms of 
weather conditions, sea conditions, and water quality conditions? The fishing industry considers that the new spark bay system would have three principal applications. Uh, the first of these is in the actual operation of the fishery itself. The second is in management of the fisheries. And the third would have an application in marketing. So all in all, the interest would certainly, the fishing industry would certainly have a considerable interest in seeing the smart base system further develop and see significant potential in the, in the development. Predicting tidal storm surges is quite often a difficult uh, decision to make uh, because of there are so many variables in terms of wind speed, wind force, barometric pressure, uh, the recent rainfall of the locality, and for a coastal coast such as Galway, the bringing in and, and uh, collecting and collating of all this real-time information uh, for a city for such as Galway is key, I believe, in the Smart Bay program to assisting uh, personnel who have roles and responsibilities and duties of care in calling out emergency services in advance of a tidal flood for uh, a city such as Galway. The Smart Bay project in Galway Bay represents uh, a tremendous opportunity for the Marine Institute. Working with IBM, we're taking the opportunity to develop really exciting new technologies that really support two major functions of the Institute. One, we're looking at the ability to monitor and protect the marine environment, and secondly, we're looking to develop really innovative new knowledge-based products of the future, the knowledge economy of Ireland's future. This Smart Bay project is a perfect example of that in motion. So as you can see there, a fairly uh, you know, big data problem uh, that's looking at all kinds of aspects to do with Galway Bay. And in a way, it's commercial, it's research, and it's also you know, protecting the citizens of Galway Bay with uh, understanding the tides and so on. And this is something that is, they're seeing as leadership and something that they think that they can really uh, extend their lifestyle and, and understand more about it as they go. And so, this is something that we think is computational from our point of view, but from their point of view, it's, uh, you know, it's extending the lifeblood of what they do. So I'm going to turn to Canada. And the last little piece here is just going to be on what we, let's bring this home and talk about things we can do. And um, as Stephen was saying, we do sp we've had a track record of over $500 million spent in R&D in Canada. So you start from a, a position of doing a lot. Um, we're, we're kind of the second largest IBM country for R&D, which is a bit interesting because IBM's in 175 countries around the world. So you can start with that and say, boy, we better hold on to this. Or you can say, let's get offensive about it. Let's start doing things and projecting how we can do more in Canada based on the, uh, the things that we know. And so last year, uh, we were very proud and pleased to announce four major projects that added up to about 500 million again of new investments in addition to the, the baseline. Um, and I'm going to give you a couple of uh, just thoughts about a, a couple of these examples. So the first in the top left was an R&D center that we launched in Ontario. We put a new data center in Ontario. We have on the bottom right um, in Bromont in our manufacturing plant that I have the chance to uh, play along with, an innovation center on microelectronics. And of course, the best one is here in, in uh, Nova Scotia. Uh, so the first one I'll talk about is uh, the Bromont Micro Innovation Center. So this is, think of nanotechnology, microelectronics, chips of the future are coming out of a fab that's coming out of the Northeast, in fact, not Silicon Valley. And so watch that space. In the next three years, you're going to be seeing fa form factors that are tiny. I mean, tiny. They're, they're huge numbers of degrees smaller than the smallest one today. And our Canadian plant which does all the chips for all of our computers, but all the chips for the Playstations and Wiis and Xboxes as well, is going to be running uh, nanotechnology of the future. And actually, you've got to get ahead of that game. You can't just show up and say, hey, I'm here. So we were able to get a project together with uh, University of Sherbrooke, with uh, two levels of government, and with Teledyne Dalsa and ourselves. And we're, this is one of the projects we worked on early. Uh, it took two years to get done. We announced it last July. The best one we have. Uh, I'm saying, I, I say this whenever I'm sitting in the right place, but this is the best one. And here's why I think it's got, um, this is our delivery center here in, in Nova Scotia. And in fact, 
again, this one is one that shows a collaboration across the six universities and the Nova Scotia Community College. And um, we see it as something that's leadership. It's something that we see as, go back to those charts and the knowledge that we have about the lack of analytic skills that are out there. And then think about how forward thinking this group is on getting together to build the curriculum for the future. And I think it's leadership. It's not being done anywhere else. This is, uh, you know, a first of its kind, if you will, and it's going to be a leadership point for this region and this province uh, going forward. So I congratulate those who have been working on this. It is, it's outstanding work, and we're well behind this, this, well behind. We're ahead of pace and uh, behind the effort here in full, full measure to make sure that this is successful. Uh, pleasure. For the sake of time, I'm going to go past into some other things, but I, I do still, we'll come back to that point. We threw be in behind here, here's something that you may not have heard of. It's, it's um, you might hear the opening of doors to universities, like I think MIT and Harvard and others have started to open up their curriculum for people to use. Well, IBM has a university inside that's pretty large. It would be a rivaling most universities, I would have to say, in terms of the, the retraining and reskilling. And we've opened that up to partners as well, so watch for this to be a backstop to even the skills that you're uh, launching here in Nova Scotia. And I just put it out there for the, the point of being aware. And then I'll just give you, um, last week, we, the, the, one of the bigger projects was this R&D center that we uh, launched in Ontario. But last week was the first year anniversary, and I'm putting it out here just because this is what can happen a year in. So I know here, we're only, we've announced in November, we just did the ribbon cutting in, say, February. So we're not long in to our partnership here in Nova Scotia, but after a year, this one has a public innovation cloud like the one in Nova Scotia. Uh, we've put some, some high performance computing in place and we picked some areas of expertise that we were looking to focus on. And we made the case, I, we were making the case in, inside the corporation that Canada is the place to do this work. And so, um, Again, there's seven universities across the bottom, plus ourselves and a couple levels of government. And uh, here are the areas that we decided to focus in on. Healthcare, Canadian healthcare, it's, it's the best in the world, so we're gonna try to find things to do things better. Uh, energy, there's a smart grid in Ontario, we're taking advantage of doing some more things on big data there. Water, happens in Ontario there, that Great Lakes is the largest freshwater supply in the world made that case to say, why don't we do something, instead of doing it always in a desert, and there's a lot of water uh, research done in Israel, I know, for, by ourselves, uh, we've chosen, we've made the case to do it in Canada as well. Uh, and cities, we just think we get along well so we can do some studies on cities. And agile computing is the major. And this is about building jobs, building economic development, and uh, providing the tools so that these uh, people can be successful. After one year, uh, as of last week, we have 34 projects that have been launched. These projects are not little projects, they're big projects. They're game-changing kinds of projects as they've come forward. You can see it's a nice spread between these seven universities. There's not many favorites in there. It's actually just, they, there's a, this scientific advisory board is made up of all the seven universities. IBM has one seat, and Don Aldridge is one of those seats, maybe two seats. Don Aldridge is one of the seats, he's here in the room. And then you can see it spread here as well by the, the different topic areas and then what platforms they're using. And I decided to just take one page. Um, each one of these projects are, are interesting. And I was able to spend time with the researchers themselves last week. And the amount of buzz that you will hear from high-end researchers who get to hire a postdoc to put on the project that now they put on the world-class platform to make it go, you, you wouldn't believe the kind of spirit and uh, belief that this is going to be something big. So at Western, uh, there's a doctor named Mark Daly who's working on uh, MRI studies in real time to look at neuro networks. And he actually has had himself in the MRI and we're watching him. And then he had a live demo with his assistant in the MRI in London. And we were watching her and her uh, what she's thinking. And of course, he's gonna apply that from healthy brains to brains that have uh, any kind of neuro disorder. And all kinds of great things are coming from there. I mentioned smart meter data analytics, water quality, urban systems, which we call sort of uh, real-time SimCity for all of Ontario. Uh, making clouds more secure. And this one, I, the last one I put on is something that's business-led. So the last round we did is said, small businesses, you actually lead the project. Don't start from academia out and, 
Of course, your criteria for getting a successful project, do you have a business, part, a business that's partnered with you? Do you have commercial outcomes that we can see? Or do you have something that we think that would be successful given the use of big data? This one came from, uh, and I met Abe, he had only started talking about this with us a month ago, a month ago. And he made it just in time for the launch, he just got his project approved by all the powers that be. Within the month, he was launched and had uh, a postdoc being hired that week. So the speed of turnaround here, maybe a little bit of the speed of business as opposed to the speed of, you know, uh, other things that we've seen in the past. We've, we've really been pressing to go quickly here and make sure that we make a difference. So watch for this as we're here. You're going to see us help in terms of getting this thing off the ground and make sure that we're successful. Um, just because this is the other thing that Don, I mentioned Don Aldridge, he's in the room in the back here, he's one of my IBM colleagues. Um, Don actually was the person that got this Artemis project together. And so I just put up a couple of slides on this. A, to say that the, in the video before, you had the Hollywood version of the baby. If anybody has seen a neonatal unit, this picture is more represented. So see the hand and the size of the patient. And I had a niece and nephew who were in this position. And you know, this is, this is something that really is a you know, very touch and go situation for these patients. And you can see here that multiple devices are attached to them in that kind of uh, setting. And what we're able to do is actually make a difference and, and again, save lives here. And, the great thing is that the project that's now in the 34 that we've launched isn't just this project. It's now taking this to the cloud so it can be done in hospitals across the country. So it's not just being done in a server close by at SickKids in Toronto. Second thing is that uh, it's now being applied to adult ICUs. So now think of adult ICU patients that are intensive care and the things that we can learn and understand about those folks before um, alarms go off for them. So game-changing kinds of things. So the last few things that uh, I'll just leave you with. It's about the approach. It's about a culture of how to do this. But in a sense, we've, we've decided that it's about public-private partnerships. You have to get those together. You have to have business-based outcomes. You have to have commercial outcomes. That's what the government wants as well, by the way. So you've heard them. Gee, I like business-led innovation. Please find a way to hook this up. And SME is small and medium enterprise. So we're all about small business and making sure that we engage. The goals here are grand challenges. We're, we're not looking for small incremental things, although those are always good, but for the kind of scales we're talking about, we want to do things that are, are you know, big, interesting things that will have a global impact when they're successful. And um, the outcomes then will be high impact, no doubt. And I, I can tell you out of the 34 projects, if we have three of them that are successful, it'll be a huge success. We expect to have 23 of them successful. Uh, and it is about failure. We don't care if they, we're not forcing people to win. It's research after all, right? But uh, we, are, we are pretty uh, pumped about the possibilities. So our, my point for imperatives for Canadian IT innovation is we have to commit that we have to make a change. The scorecard is the way it is right now. So you've got to say to yourself, it's about continuous transformation. And we've got to decide to do things differently or you're just going to get the same results. And this conference is an excellent example of trying something to do something differently. A second is to cultivate the private and public partnerships. Again, by getting together here, I congratulate you. There's opportunities to do that. And Sandra has challenged us to think about how to do that even more. And then finally, by the talk here, you can hear us saying, convert big data into solutions. And you can be the leaders in analytics and come up with solutions that have dramatic benefits in the world. And so. Uh, the last point, the last chart, is actually to say that our early feedback on how we've ap approached this thing has been extremely positive. I, I should make a small point, because it may come up in some of your discussions. We do not, we have an open IP policy. We do not launch in a small business, say, thank you very much, that's a great idea, it's not my idea. It's actually never our idea. We write the agreement so that's protecting the small business owner and the researcher. And I think that's an important underpinning to this, because otherwise it sounds like, well, What's in it for you? The good thing about it is that what's in it for me is that we have this big R&D engine in the, my corporation, and we want to do some things here in Canada to lead. And so I have that great opportunity to do it. So we're building partnerships with corporations, governments, and university colleges and hospitals across the country. And so I look forward to further partnership here in Nova Scotia. At the end here, it's about building those skills, those foundational skills that will drive the future. You guys understand that better than anybody, and you'll be the leaders in that. And so 
I look forward to working with you more in the future, and thank you very much for your time tonight.